Hello, my name is Dr. Omende and um, in this series we are going to discuss the placenta and uh, fetal membranes. So, um, we begin. The um, fetal membranes usually, of course, will be produced during pregnancy and um, the placenta generally separates the fetus um, from the endometrium of the uterus and it's usually expelled after childbirth. It has various functions. It helps to um, protect from um, toxic substances from the maternal blood from getting into the fetus. Then it has a nutritional role to provide nutrients from maternal blood to the fetus, role in respiration, allows oxygen from maternal blood to the fetus and carbon dioxide from the fetus to the mother, excretion of waste from the fetus to maternal blood, and the placenta also produces hormones such as progesterone, um, human placental lactogen, human chorionic gonadotropin hormone, and so on and so forth. And these are able to um, um, support the developing fetus. So we have four main uh, fetal membranes, the chorion, amnion, umbilical vessel, vesicle, sorry, from the yolk sac, and the allantois. So the placenta is a fetal maternal organ. It has a fetal part and a maternal part. So the fetal part is the chorionic sac, and the maternal part is formed by the decidua basalis part of the endometrium at the embryonic pole. Remember, we talked about the chorionic sac, how epiblast and hypoblast cells form an extra embryonic mesoderm, which will develop species that coalesce to form um, um, the, the chorionic sac, or rather chorionic cavity. So if you look here at the embryonic pole where implantation occurs, that decidua is called decidua basalis. Around the embryonic pole is the decidua capsularis, and the rest of the endometrium is covered by decidua parietalis. So, um, decidua reaction are just changes occurring in the endometrium during implantation. So, when the endometrium is um, able to gain substances, the glycoproteins, um, endometrial glands, you increase the uh, fluid in the endometrial glands, all this to support the developing um, fetus. So that's the decidual reaction. And all these changes are both cellular and at cellular level and vascular level. So you're increasing blood vessels so that you be able to establish a good um, utero, um, sorry, fetal maternal um, circulation. So we've talked about functions of the uh, placenta. There's the metabolic role. Okay, so it's able to um, carry out glycogen metabolism, able to transport gases and nutrients, and also as an endocrine role where it produces hormones such as human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. So then to discuss the fetal membrane, we, um, we will go straight to the definition. Okay, so these fetal membranes are usually extra embryonic. They're not part of the embryo, so they're outside the embryo and they, they separate the fetus from the endometrium. Their origin is from the zygote, and the main reason why these fetal membranes are important is because they support the developing embryo. So we have different uh, um, extraembryonic membranes. We have the chorion, the amnion, okay, there's the allantois, and the yolk sacs. And remember, at uh, this portion, that's what forms the umbilical cord. So, chorion, amnion, umbilical vesicle, yolk sac, and allantois. Those are the fetal membranes. So, we start with the amnion. The amnion um, comes from the, forms the cavity actually in the embryoblast. So, this develops in the second week. And remember, it's the epiblastic cells that form the amnioblast, cells lining the amniotic cavity. So this is the amniotic cavity here. These are the columnar epiblastic cells, so it's lined by, um, it's lined by epiblast, 
um, which are called amnioblasts. And this is your amniotic cavity filled with amniotic fluid. So this is the amniotic cavity here. And this is the intraembryonic cell. So after the folding of the embryo, this the amniotic cavity now um, spreads around the embryo. So you can see it comes all around except at the place where you have your umbilical cord. So that's your amniotic cavity lined by amnion. So where does amniotic fluid come from? Because amniotic cavity is filled with fluid. This fluid has three sources. The cells that line the amniotic cavity produce the fluid, the amnioblast, also from maternal tissue fluid and from the fetal urine. So the fetus urinates and contributes to the amniotic fluid. So what factors ensure that this fluid is in circulation? The fetus drinks the amniotic fluid. It also urinates and defecates within the, um, inside the amniotic cavity. And then there is the exchange with the fetal blood and exchange with maternal circulation. So all this ensure that this fluid is in constant circulation. Then the amniotic fluid has water, fetal cells, salts, um, fecal matter, urine, and other body secretions from the fetus. So that's the composition. What are the functions of the amniotic fluid? It's able to permit symmetrical growth of the fetus, so right and left side to grow symmetrically. It also provides protection and mechanical cushioning to the fetus. It ensures um, adequate growth of the lungs. So amniotic fluid is very important in the lung development. Then during birth, the fluid lubricates the birth canal or the vagina as the fetus is being expelled. It ensures good development of the musculoskeletal system because the limbs, as they move freely within the amniotic fluid, their development is good. Um, the fluid helps to regulate temperature and also protects the fetus from adhesion. Because if the fluid is there and the fetus is floating in the fluid, the parts of the fetal body are not close to each other, so addition will not occur. So it protects from fetal addition. What's the fate of the uh, amnion? It joins with the chorion to form the amniochorionic membrane, and this is what is released as an afterbirth. What are the abnormalities of the amniotic cavity or the amnion? We have oligohydramnios when you have very little um, amniotic fluid, polyhydramnios when you have very high amount of amniotic fluid, and amniotic band syndrome where um, the amniotic fluid forms bands around the fingers or um, digits, and that can cause amputation of the digits because of um, impairing blood supply. When you compress the digit, you impair blood supply to the distal end, and that can cause amputation. So normally the amniotic uh, membrane is 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 millimeters and the amnioblasts form the amniotic um, epithelium. So this 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 millimeters is the epithelium plus extraembryonic mesoderm. The fluid normally is 500 to 1000 mils. So when you're less than 500 mils, that's oligohydramnios. More than 2000, that's polyhydramnios. So what causes little amniotic fluid? When the placenta is not functioning well, you will not produce fluid, so it causes less amniotic uh, fluid. When you have premature rupture of membrane, so the mother will be leaking um, fluid before the pregnancy is term, so you decrease amount, you get oligohydramnios. Remember we said the fetus urinates to produce part of the fluid, so when the kidneys have not developed well in renal agenesis, you get oligohydramnios. When the kidneys are there, they are producing urine, but the outlet from the kidney, whether the ureters are obstructed, for example, in obstructive uropathy, you cannot release urine in the amniotic cavity, so you get oligohydramnios. Then also when you have obstruction of the urethra, urethral atresia can give you oligohydramnios because you're not able to pass urine into the amniotic cavity. So this is an example of um, obstructive uropathy. You can see there is um, obstruction that will cause at the urethral level, it has caused the bladder to enlarge, the ureters are enlarged, that's what you're calling hydro um, nephrosis, where the kidneys and the ureters are enlarged, the bladder is enlarged. So it means we have oligohydramnose, urine is not able to come out 
So there's less fluid and this child is not even able to move. So there'll be no symmetrical um, development. Musculoskeletal system is affected. You can see the child is developing club foot. There's no space. The child is not swimming freely. The lungs will not develop well. You can see they're small. So there's pulmonary hypoplasia because you need the fluid for lung development, limb development, symmetrical development. Okay. So oligohydramnios. So you get limb defects such as club foot and the lungs don't develop. You get pulmonary hypoplasia. Then polyhydramnios, fluid, amniotic fluid more than 2,000 mils. What are the causes? When you have esophageal atresia. Remember we said the fetus circulation of this amniotic fluid involves the fetus drinking. So if you cannot swallow because the esophagus is obstructed, you get polyhydramnios. This swallowing is controlled by the brain. If your central nervous system, including the brain, does not develop well or it has defects, you cannot swallow, you get polyhydramnios. Then in cases of multiple pregnancy, you tend to have a placenta that is sort of overworking. So the fluid that is being produced is high. So it leads to polyhydramnios. You can see this cavity. This is in multiple pregnancy. In this case, twins. You can see all how the cavity is big, is filled with fluid. So this is poly. Hydramnios, okay? Polyhydramnios. So, what does polyhydramnios cause? It will cause malpresentation. Instead of the fetus to present with the head first, they have so much fluid to move about, so they may eventually present with breech or a limb or something else. Then, because the fluid is too much, the pressure will be much, it can cause premature rupture of membrane. So, before the fetus is term, the mother can start leaking the amniotic fluid. Then it can cause cord accidents. It can push the umbilical cord um, towards the cervix and cause compression of the cord. And that depletes blood supply to the fetus and can lead to fetal death. So those are the effects of polyhydramnios. So for each oligohydramnios and polyhydramnios, you need to know what are the causes and what are the effects for each. So you can see this is an example of cord accident. The baby had so much space to move about within the cavity because of too much fluid and then the cord now goes around the neck and this can as, uh, suffocate or asphyxiate the, the fetus. This is the placenta. You can see a knot has formed because the baby was moving about in too much uh, fluid in polyadramnos then the umbilical cord knots around itself so you are not able to bring oxygenated blood to the fetus and this is going to affect the developing fetus. You can see this is normal presentation is cephalic, but you can present as breach with a um, um, gluteal region first. So this is a mal presentation. So next we discuss the yolk sac. It's formed from the blastocystic cavity, from the hypoblastic cells, which are cuboidal. It also um, forms the extraembryonic mesoderm. And usually the yolk sac membrane is called the Huesner's membrane. So this is your yolk sac cavity. This is your amniotic cavity. So what are the functions of the yolk sac? It helps to transfer nutrients to the developing fetus. It helps in development of blood. Okay. And also it's the origin for germ cells, sperms and ovum, they originate from the yolk sac. So those are the functions of the yolk sac. What is the fate of the yolk sac? Usually it will be incorporated to form a primitive gut, primitive um, gastrointestinal tract. So it will be incorporated to form a primitive gut. And then after that, it forms a vitello intestinal duct that usually obliterates. So when you can see, it is going to be incorporated to form your GIT here. So after that, it, you form a uh, vitelline duct, okay, which is supposed to obliterate. So this yolk sac will help, will be incorporated in this developing GIT. You can see the foregut, midgut, hindgut forms the GIT. So if it does not obliterate, you can get a Merkel's diverticulum. And if you have communication between skin and the, and the GIT epithelium, you get a Merkel's fistula. A fistula is just a communication between two epithelial line surfaces. Then you can get a Merkel's cyst or you can get a vitelline sinusis. Okay, so those, that's the fate of the yolk sac.